puts audience at the center of everything that we do. Um, so we really believe in trying to serve communities in new ways, building relationships and trust with our audiences, and using new technologies um, as one way to do that. So we, we like to talk about it a lot of, as journalism as a service rather than as a product. So the idea behind that is, you know, instead of just slapping a sexy headline on the awesome article that you wrote, um, you're actually trying to understand a little bit about what your, your audience's problems are, what their needs are, and how you as a journalist can fulfill those. So it's just kind of tweaking things a little bit on, uh, from the way you might typically think about journalism. Um, and, and certainly that's gotten all the more inter interesting kind of post-Trump as news organizations everywhere are really kind of talking about, you know, how can we rebuild trust? So that's sort of the short version of that. If anyone that is listening to this doesn't know more about our program, uh, there's a lot of stuff online or I can always like answer questions about that later. But our main purpose for being here is we have three of our amazing social journalism alumni um, who have gone on after graduation to get some really cool jobs. And we just wanted to hear a little bit from them about you know, what their experiences have been like, get some insight from them on you know, how they apply social journalism in their work or what challenges there are as, as they're trying to do that, because it's not always easy, as we all know. So, um, I will, uh, shall I let you guys introduce yourself? I'll let you, yeah, I can do that. Uh, let's start with, a, I'm like, I can talk about it, but like, it's probably more interesting if I just shut up, and I'm also really loud, so uh, I'm blasting everyone. Um, so why don't we just go down and just give us like the short uh, version of of what you're up to now, and we'll start with uh, Rachel. Um, I'm Rachel Bukas. I uh, run the Documenting Hate Project at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative newsroom based here in New York. I am Duran Dalton, uh, fan army entertainment editor at The Tilt. I can explain what The Tilt is a little bit more later, um, but yeah. It's a very cool title. We'll, we're, I'm very excited to explore more about what Duran does every day. Um, and my name's Caitlin Gillum, and I just graduated last year from the program. Uh, and I work for Meetup, uh, which I can talk more about who we are and what we do later, as Duran said. And um, I'm a community specialist there, so I primarily work with our organizers and our members uh, to ensure that they're creating impactful and uh, long-lasting communities wherever they are in the world. Hey, I'm so proud. Sorry, yeah, I'll we'll be very proud of these guys. Um, yeah, so why don't we go uh, a little bit deeper than that and tell us a little bit about kind of like what um, you know, kind of what your your role is is like. You know, sort of what your responsibilities are because I think a lot of people still sort of wonder, you know, what a, what a social journalist actually do out in the real world and, and what is it like to do that so tell us a little bit more about like what your what your gigs are like now so i have kind of a strange job because it's one that hadn't really existed before this project is new it started this year and even before that um propublica didn't have a person in my position for their previous large collaborative projects so I'm kind of making it up as I go along, to be totally honest with you. Um, but essentially, it's a mix of project management um, and traditional journalism and social journalism, uh, distribution on social media, um, and cat herding, is what I would say. Um, but it's just a, a lot of everything, but I would say that one of the things that I spend a lot of time on is being an evangelist, and I'm an evangelist for the project, but I am also essentially an evangelist for social journalism to get people to uh, buy into the idea that they can get worthwhile stories out of the public, um, because our, our project is basically uh, a lot of it is crowdsourced. Um, and Tell a little bit about in case. I mean, I know, yeah, I know a lot of these guys know, know, but there may be people uh, like watching that don't know exactly sure. in case. So <laughs> we, we uh, track and report on hate crimes and bias incidents in the United States, and we collect 
that information from the public through a forum we have on our site and also through civil rights groups and we're also doing a branch of the project by asking police departments directly. Um, so since uh, a good portion of what we have so far comes from the public, a lot of what I try to do is convince people that there are stories to be found in what people are telling us. Um, that they, it's not just uh, breaking news things that occasionally we have people do that like this thing happened yesterday in my city so I should report on it, but there's uh, deeper and more interesting things there if you're willing to spend the time to um, work on it. Um, so I would say, yeah. Rachel was also at Univision for a little while before this. Do you want to just briefly oh, mention what you sure. So uh, last year I worked as a like general assignment reporter at Univision um, as part of a very small English language team that was embedded on the uh, digital news team. Um, so I was doing a mixture of reporting and translation and adaptation because we did a lot of back and forth between um, the Spanish language and English language content um, and working on a couple of longer term projects. And I actually worked on Election Land, which was a public project as the representative from Univision um, at the end of last year. Um, still working? Cool. So basically, I'm going to start with what the tilt is because some of you are probably wondering. That's the tilt with the Y. Check us out on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. So basically it's a platform that highlights two sides of a conversation happening online or, or, or even an evergreen argument. And we present those binaries as hashtags that allow our community to vote on either side of that argument. And so as the Fan, Fan Army Entertainment Editor, I have a lot of different responsibilities. Um, first and foremost, I do um, Spearhead, Spearhead or lead the vertical, which is our first vertical on Facebook, uh, called Fan Army. And basically how that got started is um, because of the amount of mobilization that um, was happening around Fan Army, so on Twitter, particularly Twitter, and also somewhat on Facebook as well. But um, basically there I tag uh, Fan Armies and, or, and I pose, and usually it's a team hashtag, and Fan armies are pretty mobilized on voting on who they stand for, like stand in terms of the Eminem hit. Um, so we found like a lot of our success there. Um, we spearheaded like a lot of our success, and um, yeah, fan armies like the the amount of traffic that it brings to the site actually um, has bumped up a lot of the polls for other sections as well. Um, so we have four sections: politics, sports, and culture, as well as entertainment. And yeah, a lot of the work that I've been able to do mobilizing fan armies because they're so prevalent on social media has actually um, bumped up sessions in what we call post meeting votes, uh, where you vote and then you share the vote on social. Um, yeah. That's pretty much what I do on a daily basis. I write um, debates um, and then I mobilize people online um, to continue that conversation. And sometimes it's an enterprise story, so I kind of create the conversation myself. So like if it's like today, Sierra's birthday, I would do like, what's your favorite Sierra um, smash of like, all time? And that mobilizes fans to vote for either side. Um, but a lot of times it's face-offs, like I might do something like, who deserves to win best or be female artist at the Billboard Awards for Beyonce. Rihanna share team Rihanna or team Beyonce and mobilize both their families to vote. What I think is really interesting about what Duran is doing, I mean, some of the, even in the very early online days of like dial up, um, you know, a lot of the energy and a lot of the community was coming out of pop culture fans. I mean, if yeah. you sort of remember like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer had all kinds of like chat groups. Found things. a lot of success there too, yeah. Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that, Buffy you know, stories. that's an area that like news organizations have really not like, how do you tap some of that passion? Especially now that we have even more kind of avenues and more social networks to have these discussions. Like, how do we tap into some of that? So I think it's really interesting that, because they're kind of, you guys are kind of experimenting too, right? Like, it's a new. I mean, it's a unit of advanced media, which is a much bigger company, but you're kind of experimenting with it. Yeah, that. we're their first um, startup project, so 
advanced as long as bought their immediate property. So this is like the first starter project ever um, under advanced. Yeah, and I have a feeling that the rest of the company is kind of looking at you guys to see yep. like what <laughs> what can they learn from for like other brands, you know, within their you know within their ecosystem and what you guys are doing there. So yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, but yeah, the key has pretty much been community outreach for entertainment and other sections as well, but for entertainment it's more so tagging like those fan accounts and like pretty much like, I guess, what's the word, like poking them to let them know that, hey, this is a conversation that we're having, participate in it, and typically they, like people, like I said, they love to vote on what their favorite is and, and what they stand for and what they love, so that's been a pretty big avenue of success for the tool. All right, Caleb. First of all, I'm so jealous of this hat. Like, I can't even, like, <laughs> it's just great flair, you know. Um, yeah, and so because I know a lot of you in this room are in the program right now, and, and kudos because I know it's super hectic right now, so uh, I appreciate you listening. But uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do at Meetup, and then I'll tell you a little bit about um, what social journalism has now allowed me to do kind of in the next stage of my career path at Meetup. Um, and so Meetup is, I'm kind of a uni the unicorn on the panel because Meetup is technically a social networking platform. Um, so a little bit less journalistic uh, and a little bit more social media-esque. Um, but essentially, we are an online platform that really pushes for offline community building. Um, and that's what we do. And so in my work as a community specialist on the day-to-day, um, like I said earlier, I'm either speaking to organizers or members through email, um, you know, trying to coach them through what makes a great meetup, uh, how they can engage their communities, how they can um, grow their communities. And then I'm also um, approving any new groups that come through our meetup site. So if you wanted to create a brand new group, um, I and, and my teammates are the ones filtering through those and deciding, okay, like, does this align with our mission and values? Um, if not, we give a little bit of coaching to that person. Uh, and then allow them to try again or just say like this isn't a good fit for us. And so that's kind of what I do on the day-to-day -day, sprinkled in with also um, running internal what we call meetup crawls, which is where if you're new to meetup in the company, um, we go out all over New York City and we surprise meetup organizers uh, with, with some swag and we hear their stories and we listen and we ask for feedback. Uh, and so we do that internally within the company and I help, uh, I lead that, that project. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing currently. Um, what I'm excited to share that was just announced yesterday to Meetup is that, um, yeah, it's fresh, it's fresh, right out of the oven. But uh, I, so let me say what social journalism has done for this first. In pitching this idea to Meetup, um, I think me having a background in social journalism and in the program, uh, it really helped me kind of push this idea forward, which is that for the next, so in March of 2018, from March of 2018 to March of 2019, I will be traveling to a different city and country each month, um, working remotely for Meetup, but at the same time I will be, yeah, that's cool, but at the same time I'll be um, hosting organizer meetups, uh, really pushing for growth internationally, listening to organizer stories and pushing those to our marketing team, uh, and then also just gathering as much feedback about our product as possible. Uh, and I'm doing that in partnership with a company called Remote Year. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, Remote Year, they're all over social media. Feel free to feel free to check them out. But I say that because uh, in pitching this idea to my company, uh, I used a lot of my experience in my graduate work of building community, what I understand community to be. Uh, and that was a huge part of like them kind of giving me the green light to say like, okay, like we're gonna let you do this. Um, and on top of that, we're opening this opportunity up to anyone at Meetup. Uh, so this is a kind of like a huge deal and I, I partially thank my background in social journalism for kind of pushing the conversation um, with that. That's so cool. And I think, you know, I mean, even though this is a journalism school and we love journalism. I think in some ways, Caitlin is doing, I mean, every, I think your job is very fundamentally almost the most aligned with some of the things that we learned about, you know, engaging communities. And at least to me, it matters less where you're doing it, but that you are doing it. And then in your case, you get to do, I mean, the New York Times, you guys probably saw it, just put out a job ad recently that was like, 
travel the world or whatever, and you know, and it's been shared like a million times. It's like one of their top ranking stories. Period. I mean, it's a job ad, but it's like ranked. But I mean, Caitlin basically like it's more or less you kind of get to do that. So I'm really really excited for you. And it's very well deserved too. So. Awesome. So, um, if you guys can, I mean, I know it, maybe you've blocked it out. <laughs> now you're back here in 308. They gave their final presentations in here, as many of you will. Um, you know, just, they remember the, the stress of the last few weeks of the semester. But, um, I mean, if you guys could just uh, tell us a little bit about kind of like your projects in the program and you know some element of that that you were really proud of or that you felt like helped you you know get some kind of insights that that maybe helped you like going forward they all three did really interesting work while, while they were here too so um so i worked on immigration reporting while i was here uh focusing on undocumented immigrants we uh, john and i were in the program in 2015 so Yes. Uh, and that was the year that Trump announced his run for the presidency, and this wave of renewed xenophobia began. Um, and I think I had actually sort of picked this idea uh, before that, um, but it just so happened to sort of align with the times, I guess. Um, so my final project was um, a collaborative project. At the time, I was working at Medium. At the time, Medium had an editorial team. Um, so I was, I basically went and tried to find people who would tell their stories about um, getting, becoming legal immigrants, so to speak, so how they got their documentation, whether that was through DACA, or whether that was through getting a green card through marriage, or as a refugee. Um, there are many, many ways you can get legal status here. So um, I had to tap into a lot of sources and people I knew to try to find people willing to tell their stories. Um, I, the ask was, can you, can you write your own story for a couple of people? I interviewed them and condensed their interview into like a first person narrative. Um, and then I combined them all um, into this one sort of landing page and then invited other people to write their story if they wanted to contribute and got a few contributions that way as well. Um, so I think from that, um, one of the things I learned is how difficult it is to get people to do something for you. Um, even if it's uh, not a necessarily huge lift, um, and that certainly applies to my current job because basically I am trying to convince journalists to do to work on something, even though it's for the most part the people who are interested in it are already doing reporting on this. So it's not like it's. I try to explain to them that it's not an added burden to what they're already doing. It should just be helping the work they're already doing. Um, but the experience of having to convince people to do something for me as a journalist was very informative because it's also a huge part of um, crowd-powered journalism, which is something I'm super interested in. Um, I work with Terry Paris, who for many of you was your professor, um, and with very closely with his team, and uh, everything that his team does is um, trying to get people to tell their story, to write in and tell their story, whether that's about maternal mortality or about um, Trump's properties in your city. Uh, we have just a, a lot of crowd-powered stuff. So um, I, I learned a lot about the art of convincing people to take an action um, for the purposes of Um, so when I was here, I was doing um, slightly, di well, very much so different work than what I'm doing right now. Um, I covered the Black Lives Matter community, well, contextualizing um, the intersectionality of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and basically what I mean by that is that um, news media seemed at the time to focus more on like how black cisgender men 
uh, were victims of police violence. And the Black Lives Matter community, they were saying that, hey, our movement is more, um, it's more than just that. Like, we are focused on that, and you should be focused on that. But we're also focused on other um, identities of blackness and the issues that they face. So they, when they say Black Lives Matter, they really meant all Black Lives Matter. And so I really focused on how news media was overlooking or poorly covering certain narratives. And also, um, that kind of led into mis misperceptions about the movement and covering, contextualizing um, those misperceptions. Perceptions. So I can break it down by like semester and how I kind of built relationships with the community. Basically, the first semester I really focused on source building and interacting online or social with the community. Um, second semester, I continued to do that and covering like those misconceptions and or just contextualizing their narratives like police, like data on police violence or stuff, stuff like that. Um, but I also started focusing on building out um, solutions to what their issues were. And that kind of led into the final semester and introducing um, a website and a project, um, I guess a community engagement project called Black Narratives Matter. And also doing more um, reporting at Dilly Dot as their intern politics intern I was covering the Black Lives Matter movement and really contextualizing um, Whatever misconceptions existed within the movement, and there were a lot, there were a lot of criticisms and misconceptions. So I addressed that in my reporting and getting those perspectives from the community itself. Um, but I also, towards the end of the semester, um, did an event called Black Narratives Matter: How to Source Build with uh, How Black Journalists Can Source Build with uh, Black Activists in the Movement. And basically, it brought together people who were kind of at the intersections of journalism and activism and giving their perspectives on what news media could be doing better in covering black narratives. And that's really what like, my final project really focused on, like collaborating with the community. So on one hand, reporting and potentializing those narratives, and you know, on the other hand, um, collaborating with the, um, the community on how news media can do a better job at covering black narr narratives in general. Right here in this very room. Yeah. <laughs> Duran was Pretty good. Kind of, actually, I was telling him that I got a photo from that event on one of my slides that I use like all the time when I talk about what social J is. I love that photo. It's like a giant a lot of, of everyone in the black, world. beautiful faces in that photo. A lot of melanin happening. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So about a week before, no, a couple of weeks before I started uh, the graduate program last year, I got a Facebook message from a friend of mine that I had traveled with years ago saying, I have this uh, amazing friend who lives in New York City who is doing this really cool thing where she is um, bringing senior citizens and, and pairing them with young professionals and doing one-on-one -on -one technology lessons with them. And she's like just starting, it just sounds like something that like, you would be interested in volunteering for and like helping with. Um, and at the same time, ironically, I was searching for what I would kind of focus on for the year uh, in you know the Social J program. And so it kind of just became this like beautiful partnership between, um, her name is Ellie Epstein, who is a person who kind of created this program. I met her for coffee and we had this conversation about what the social journalism program does and what she was looking to do. Um, and then we just kind of built this partnership and that was literally, the program that we built was my year at, uh, at CUNY. And so the name of the program is called Why Are the Wise, W-I-S-E. It is still full on functioning, happening. We've partnered with Apple uh, and do events at their Soho location. Uh, and that's been a pilot program that is ending November 19th, but there will be more with Apple. So that's kind of the end of what's happened. But uh, I worked with her all throughout the year, and it was really, um, we were very focused on in real life community building. So I did a lot of events. Um, almost every Sunday I was at, you know, a YMCA or in this building, um, bringing senior citizens together with young professionals uh, to not only allow seniors the seniors to get the help they needed with technology but it, it became this beautiful kind of like understanding of two different generations um, and like kind of understanding the differences but also the similarities and kind of seeing the relationships form between 
um, an 88 year old woman and a 23 year old woman and, and you know hearing them go out and have coffee together or exchange books and it kind of became this beautiful community of people uh, and then also as you all know at the same time all of this was happening um, we elected not we maybe in this room but our country elected Donald Trump as president and so I kind of started thinking about you know as many differences in age and you know status that senior citizens and professionals may have um, they got in a room together and you know all that mattered at one point was them having a conversation with each other and finding similarities uh, amongst you know each other and so uh, that became kind of at the end of the program that became a really amazing takeaway for me and like why can't we kind of build journalism in that way and like breaking it down and bringing people putting people in a room around a common interest and really breaking down those barriers and allowing those conversations and those stories to develop um, when you put people in a room and face to face and let them have these kind of conversations and so I'm super proud of, of that program if you ever want to volunteer let me know. Uh, we're still running events all over the place, and it's exciting to see that to see that grow. And it's funny because Meetup, I work at Meetup, and we're like three blocks down from the Soho Apple office, <laughs> so it's really fun. It's like all the worlds are colliding. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what it did. I should say, by the way, that all three of them did a really nice job, like writing about their practical project on Medium. So if you if you're interested in knowing more about what they did, you can find them um, on the internet. It talks a lot about people's stuff. Good. Um, all right, well, this is not all propaganda. We also have current students in here. So there are certainly challenges in doing social journalism. I mean, like I said at the beginning, not everyone even knows what that is. Um, some people immediately assume that if you care about a community at all, that that means you're a biased advocate and you can't possibly do any form of real journalism. I mean, that. Those attitudes do unfortunately exist, even though I'm seeing more and more, you know, uh, we talked about this last week, online news association, tons of talk about community building and engagement. So we're really, I think, cresting a wave to where this is becoming more popular. But I mean, since you guys are working in the field, I mean, what are some of the, you know, and Rachel talked about this a little bit before, but some of the challenges in doing this kind of work or, you know, just, I mean, in general, doing journalism is not always the easiest business. And kind of how do you, how do you overcome those and, and think about that? Well, the first one isn't really related to sort of the day to day, but I saw um, Julia Hasslinger, who is our classmate, one of our classmates, this past weekend at a conference. I told her I was going to this, and she said, Oh, you should talk about how the fact that the first year all of us lost our jobs, uh, a lot of us lost our jobs, or like quit our jobs, or like there was a lot of turnover the first year after we graduated. Um, and I would have to like think more carefully about each person in our class, but like there was uh, a lot of turnover that first year after we graduated. So I was working at Medium, and then I went to Univision, then I got laid off in this series of um, cuts that they did at the end of the year. Um, and there are other people who got laid off uh, this year or last year. Um, and there was just a lot of, it was very sort of a tumultuous year career-wise, I think, for a lot of us who graduated in 2015. Um, I think that is unfortunately part of the industry right now, um, but I also think it is a part of, uh, you know, like this part of our career path where sometimes it's just going to be a little bit rocky. Um, and the nice thing is we weren't alone in that. It, this sort of turnover type stuff happened to a lot of us um, over the course of the past two years, I guess. Um, so that's just something I would warn you about, that like this is not a stable industry. It's a struggling industry uh, where you have executives wanting to pivot to video and laying off their digital and audience people. Um, there's layoffs are inherently a part of this business. You have to just be prepared for that and not take it personally because it happens all the time. If you follow media people on Twitter, you will like every couple months or so see like, today was my last day at X company. I'm really sad. Bye colleagues. Uh, so I would just say that is the big thing of the stability of the industry. Um, 
being at a nonprofit, we have similar problems. All of our work is inherently tied to grants and donations and things. So it's just um, that is, I think, one big challenge I would. Yeah, I think it's definitely true. Although, I mean, I can't generalize everyone, but I think a lot of you actually, the second job you got was even, like, amazing. <laughs> so they also did really well kind of, like, bouncing back. And I think maybe, I mean, I, I can't take all the credit for their brilliance, certainly, but I think, you know, having some skills that are maybe a little bit more cutting edge, kind of in addition to more traditional reporting, maybe helps you a little bit to do that. But, you know, I'm biased, so. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'm one of the, <laughs> the the lucky ones. I've been in the same job since April 1st, 2016. And um, that was a little over three months after we graduated. And that, that was like my cutoff. I was just like, I have to have a job by March or April. And it was hired in March. But I will, I will say that it is, um, or was, a little scary at the very beginning working for a startup and not knowing what was going to happen, but I guess that was also the um, exciting part about it. Um, and I also got lucky in the sense of, like, Carrie actually helped me get my, get this job. Um, she forwarded the email from David Cohn, who was a big deal in journalism, um, about the Tilt, the starter project by Vance. Um, and I replied, and it was like a two-month process, and I basically helped launch the tilt and have been growing ever since and you know growing uh, I guess there's growing growing pains but ultimately I guess at the very beginning I think the right the correct phrase is preaching to the choir um, about social journalism and like how I came out of this awesome program and how what we're doing to tilt directly relates to social day and how I can draw from that. But I guess over time, I just kind of, I don't want to say I snuck it in because no one was against it. It's just that, you know, when you get wrapped up into like the day-to-day -day stuff, like it takes time to like be listening and trying to build relationships with communities. But um, I took like the early experiments and I basically made them more consistent um, in the different projects that I was doing at the tilt. Around about a year ago, uh, I think that the first project I did that was successful was actually a collaborative project with my boss called Monster Madness, which actually um, is a bracket that we bring up this year. You all should check it out. We're in the final round. It's Michael Myers versus Chucky again, uh, a rematch. So vote whichever team you know. <laughs> um, so I get to do stuff like that, basically. Um, but I basically took those early successes and made them something more consistent with how I was listening and um, trying to do outreach and build relationships with these different um, communities. And I found my niche, a niche um, as a pop culture journalist. And because of that, um, we were just like editors who wrote and edit and produced social for different types of stories that there were no section editors at the very beginning. But because I had success as an entertainment editor, we eventually verbalized and people got to focus more on like what they were passionate about and interested in and the communities that they knew or understood a little bit more. And so I guess social J can also be a very natural thing that happens in some of these spaces, depending on what kind of spaces you are existing in. Obviously, if you're in a legacy media space, there's going to be um, struggles there. I can only um, assume from what I hear the struggles. I don't have that issue because I purposefully decided not to go in that direction. And I guess the, the common trend among the three of us is that we all went into, I don't want to say alternative media, but I guess startup slash more. The newer has been yeah, newer, around newer for media places. And generations. we don't consider ourselves like a, we're definitely not a new. Um, entity, but we are media related, and um, we um, definitely implement on a daily basis journalistic values and the work that we do. We are, we are all journalists. We all have, um, for the most part, we all have bachelor degrees in journalism, the editor of the at least. And so um, we're pretty much, I guess, finding like the space that allows you to be innovative and experimental is um, important. But even with that, there's going to be risks and um, some rockiness. I kind of want to do like a study 
have time to do studies anymore. But like, I'm super interested to see how you could, I mean, nothing wrong with doing this pop culture, but I'm really interested, like, can we learn anything from what you're doing and then apply it to like politics? Oh, I'm, work, I'm, trying, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to apply it to the different um, sections of the tilt yeah. and like the different types of debates that we do with the tilt. So we also have had, um, have had success in politics as well, but you know, um, it was very easy in the early days to have successes in um, politics because of the 2016 elections, and yeah. obviously there's a mobilized Bernie um, community and Hillary community and Trump supporters, and so we've been able to do a lot of outreach to those communities and really get them involved in our um, polls. So, I mean, we still have a lot of success um, with Trump, obviously, because that's the era that we're in, and as well as Bernie and Hillary related content to this day. So, it's, not, it's not just um, entertainment, but it's also sports and politics as well. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think, I think they both did a great job of kind of explaining uh, the challenges. So I'll just, I'll briefly say that I think that as we all know, like journalism is at a, a point of rebirth. Um, and I think that we're not quite there yet, obviously. We're still trying to figure out um, I think we're getting closer, but I think we're still trying to figure out like what what will it look like and what will it be five years from now, ten years from now. And I, so my advice is that I think that is the challenge uh, initially is that something has to change and things are changing. Um, but I think that a great part of this program I think is that you're on like you're on the right side of history in terms of. Um, in terms of being thinking more progressively about it and also um, you know you're in this program because you want to help enable that change uh, and you want to be you know on the front lines of kind of leading that and so I think that like as challenging as it is in the moment uh, I think social journalism might be a little bit ahead of its time and that's a good thing because I think that uh, that will only lead to what will ultimately be, I think, the future of journalism. And I think that you guys are, um, you, you've got it in your hand. We just have to kind of wait for, you know, technology and everything to kind of like align in terms of what journalism will look like in the future. And uh, I also have to shout out to Carrie because she sent an email to the CEO of Meetup. Um, and I got an interview, I think, the next day. <laughs> So, uh, so connections are super important, and also, two people who are super high up in the meetup world came from the New York Times, uh, and so it's interesting to see kind of the the blending there of um, of like a legacy, you know, media place, and then also them lending their ideas to what we do. Uh, and I think that just goes to show you that the the program itself is open to interpretation, and uh, I think you've got your hands on a lot of different things, and I think that'll serve you well um, as you kind of like ride the wave of figuring it out. Awesome. Caitlin always has like the money quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm seeing the pull quotes, like just some work. Gosh. <laughs> awesome. It's the coffee. <laughs> I know, I need more of that. Um, um, so, yeah, what is some, uh, I mean, you guys are now, like, you know, you, you were sitting here not that long ago, and now you're wise and you know all the things. <laughs> yeah, time is really, about really going past. Um, but, you know, what is some advice that you guys have either for these folks or for people that are just maybe thinking that they might want to get a social journalism degree? Like, what what would be some, some words of wisdom that you guys have? Um, so, I would say that um, focus, learn to focus your, um, yourself onto what matters right at this moment, right? So you guys have a lot of stuff that you have to finish by the end of the year, along with worrying about finding a job um, and maybe you know, moving to other places potentially if you're not from here. Um, so I would say try to focus on just one thing at a time. Um, there's a book that a colleague of mine had recommended, I still haven't read it, but it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, uh, where you have to learn how to focus your priorities of what you're worrying about at any given time. Um, so I would just say that um, you know you have certain things you're going to have to finish for school, 
know, certain things you're going to have to think about for your career, and then you're going to also have, you know, adult shoes that we all have, whatever that may be. Um, so I would just say, don't stress yourself out. I think a lot of our, us in our class, <laughs> I can speak for myself and say I did, uh, but I think a lot of us were just super, super stressed trying to deal with all of these things, but I would just say, take it easy, give fewer fucks, and uh, everything will work out um, in a matter of time. Um, but the way that you're ultimately going to get a good job and to get on a career path is by being successful here and meeting people here and befriending people here. Um, so everything is going to lead you to the next step, but you have to make it happen here first. Yeah, I mean, I would say as someone that spent a lot of time in grad school, I mean, not here, but <laughs> at various places, I mean, that, and that actually hasn't changed once I got out. <laughs> that, you know, I mean, we do work in an industry that's very busy and there's a lot going on. And the good part about that is it's a new thing every day and there's lots of challenges and it's very intellectually stimulating. But I mean, also, like, there's just, there's always going to be a little bit more that you wish you could do or, like, you know, one more thing that you could make a little bit more perfect. But, you know, you, you do kind of have to learn to kind of juggle with that a little bit. I think kind of no matter what, you end up. Say, listen to Carrie. <laughs> I paid them a lot to participate in this panel. Like, you know, like, this is all a lot of the, like. Because she, she, she has your back. Um, but yeah, I would just, uh, I guess, the kind of sort of build on to what uh, Rachel was saying. Yeah, definitely uh, focus on one thing at a time, but also at the same time, immerse yourself as much as you possibly can. Um, because it takes a village to raise a grad student. <laughs> no, seriously, like I, I, I took the time and invested in um, getting to know um, the people in the, in the regular program, the faculty, um, obviously social day staff. But uh, because of that, it, it also led to even more opportunities because I, I knew Colleen. Um, I got to go to the NABJ conference that year in 2015 for free and um, did some recruiting for them, but I also, um, at the very last day of the career fair, um, met someone who helped me get my internship at the Daily Dot, which was a part of my, directly a part of my community practice come the final semester. Um, and also, like I said, Carrie has your back. She got on a train and <laughs> with me, we got on like the two or three train. And we went down to Fidei and met with this person that I met in NBJ. Um, and that day he said, I just found out about a politics um, internship, and I think you'd be really good for it. And about a month later, I was starting to really die and directly doing work for my practicum there. Um, and also, like I said, I got my job because of Carrie, because of that email she forwarded to all of us. And I'm just like, no one's going to respond to this? I will. <laughs> I got a job. And I, I, for the most part, enjoyed my job. So I would say, immerse yourself as much as you possibly can and get to know um, as many people while you're here um, because it, you know building that um, network could lead to some really great opportunities for you. Yeah I think um, I mean for those of you that are already here know this but I mean if you're not I mean this school has so much going on all the time there's like amazing events and, you and, know, free food. and yeah there's a lot of free food oh. and booze <laughs> and don't know. Great faculty members that even if they don't teach in our program are amazing, or coaches, and I think Durant did a really good job of like taking advantage of all of that, even though, you know. We're By the way, um, when I was going through like the process of getting hired into Tilt, I had the research center like literally edit every single email. So I'm like, you can find help pretty much anywhere at the space code. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, I also agree. Like, give give less fucks. That's a good one. Uh, but I also think like I remember at this stage last year, uh, I think it, it became kind of a point of like, are you gonna just coast it out and say like I did it? Or are you gonna push yourself to really like make the thing that you want to make and make it as best as you possibly can? 
And I challenge you to take the second option. Uh, because I think if you can just push yourself through this last little bit, I think you'll feel much prouder of yourself when you stand up here and you present your ideas and your thoughts. And, and I think that that will only serve you well um, when you continue. I also think that uh, we're on the cusp of like community being a big, big deal. Bigger than it is uh, currently. We talk about this a lot at Meetup. Um, because we've never really had to worry about Facebook being competition for us or Google being competition for us. But we're starting to see a lot of talk about, um, I don't know if you look on Google, you'll see like they're using the term meetup, they're using the term community. Facebook is really pushing in real life community. Community engagement is really, um, people are craving it and people are wanting it. And so I hope that gives you hope and inspires you to uh, to think more about that and to, to create that community in whatever way, shape, or form uh, you're doing it now. And for people that are interested in social journalism, I hope that that's like um, an exciting thing to think about because I think that uh, people, as much virtual reality and as much of that stuff that we've got going on that's great and enhances our lives, I think that people are really craving connection um, in a way that, that they haven't in a long time. And so we're seeing that a lot at Meetup, and we, we honestly think that Meetup was built 10 years before it should have been, and we think that our time kind of is now as a company to create community and to, um, to make that happen everywhere. And so I, I hope that gives you some, um, some inspiration to kind of like keep building community. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's actually some good research backing up that we're seeing a giant surge of people that really want more authenticity, want more real world connections, or even just digital connections, but ones that are a little bit more meaningful. And I think that really is happening. I also think, I mean, unfortunately, not all that's going into like hiring journalists, but I mean, from the foundation and nonprofit sector, I mean, there's money absolutely pouring into journalism to try to understand how we can build trust. You know, News Integrity Initiative that Jeff Jarvis runs here at CUNY, I mean, millions of dollars looking at how we can do that. Um, and those kind of grants are being given out all the time. Now, I don't know what that ultimately means, but I think it's an encouraging sign that like a lot of people these days are really interested in this and want to at least test you know, we don't all have the answers, but we want to at least kind of test that out. So I think that makes it a particularly exciting time to be, you know, kind of doing this kind of work, even though, like we said before, I mean, this is, it's challenging stuff. It's not always going to be easy. I mean, that's an important thing to acknowledge. Yeah. Also, if it makes you feel any better, Starbucks, like, completely took down their online store. And they're, like, focusing, like, they're stripping that down. Yeah. They're focusing on, like, creating more, like, in real life community. I know that's a coffee shop and not a media company, but I think that like there's some potential there. Yeah, totally. Cool. Um, I mean, I have other things I could ask, but um, I should stop dabbering. Does anyone here have any uh, questions for this group? Uh, anything they've talked about or anything like that? Oh yeah, sorry, repeating it for the live stream. Yeah, uh, asking like if you told people, your friends and family who were applying to social journalism, what did they think? Did they even know what that meant? You know, I, I mean, I think applying to any journalism right now, a lot of people are like, well, why did you do that? There's a lot of layoffs in that industry. Yeah, what do you guys I had to explain it to my mother and pretty much everyone. I had to explain it to them. I had to, it, because it was the first class. It was only because we were the first class I had to explain it to myself. <laughs> Because honestly, I joined because I really wanted to be a social media editor at the very beginning. I mean, I obviously, obviously that includes engaging with communities, but it, I realized that I did, in fact, make the right choice um, within like the first month of the program. I was just like, yeah, I'm definitely on the right track to get the type of job that I want. And it kind of has kind of shifted since then, but it's still within the same build house. And like I said, you, you get like, by getting to this, that you, you get like a variety of different skills that, you know, there's plenty of different like 
sub areas of social data that you can go into if you want to focus in on something specifically? Um, I would say that uh, I, my friends and family still don't understand, uh, you know, two years later. Uh, I honestly don't think that my employers understand, except for Terry and the engagement team, to be honest. Like, I don't, I, at Provoca, I just say that I'm a CUNY alumni. I don't, like, if, if they ask more specifically, I'll tell them, but, like, the only people who really get it are engagement people. Um, and then when I'm talking to journalism, people in the world of journalism and media, I usually explain it as um, engagement and audience focused journalism, and usually you have to maybe give some examples of what that means, but usually people assume it means social media, like social media management, oh, yeah. and I have to explain that's not so oh, there are a lot of people here at CUNY that would call this program. I'm not sure if this still happens, the social media program. And if not the social media program, the social justice program. Just oh, like, I've gotten that too. It's like, so you're in the social journalist justice program. So like, no, social journalism. Well, then you're like, I mean, we like social justice. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and we have a number of students like. Did they do the work that do I did? Or, that's not sort of the only Rachel thing. did. They would also assume that it's social justice because our communities are social justice focused, but I'm just like, no, th all these things are a part of it, but it's really about building stronger relationships and engaging with communities and building solutions for those communities too. I don't have much more to add other than they're like, how much does it cost you? And I was like, really? <laughs> okay. Um, but no, I think like another way to kind of explain it is I looked into a lot of graduate programs when I was thinking about going back to grad school. I was looking at nonprofit, and you know that track I was looking at different. I was an English teacher in my past, um, and so like writing has always been kind of something I enjoyed. But I think like where it kind of like drew the line and was a bit of a, a risk, but like a positive risk was kind of like. Do I want to go to graduate school and like listen to something that's already happening and just like absorb that information, or do I want to be on the cusp of like building something bigger um, and having the potential to like leave a footprint in in that space? Um, and so I took the path of like building something and uh, being like the first few to to try that out. And so that's kind of like. When I told my parents, that's kind of how I laid it out. Is like it was a passion of mine, and like that's where I saw myself. Um, but yeah, they definitely asked me like how much it would cost, though. So I will say to be partisan, it costs a lot less than you know some of the other schools. Yes, they don't follow New York City. They do. I can't I mean, yeah. any names, but we are very reasonable. No, I mean I also you know I I do think I mean I'm biased. I've taught journalism now for a long time, but I mean, I do think these are also like very transferable skills. I mean, even if like every news organization suddenly imploded like tomorrow, I feel like you guys have a lot of like, you know, <laughs> writing and talking to people and understanding social media, like I feel like those are good, those are like really good things to have. That's not to say that we don't want you to get like your dream job or work in a newsroom, but I mean, I don't think it's something where like, you know, you train just for one exact thing, and if that's not there, oh no, everything is like all over here, you're screwed, you know, I mean, I think it's a little, a little bit broader than that. Yeah, no? Um, well, I think it's really interesting to hear about the Provoca program, because I think that's something that I would like to ask students, like, what did you learn from this class, and what did you take away from it? Like, what did you learn from this class that you ever took, and what class would you add to the curriculum if you had a choice? All right. Any class would you? <laughs> I did? Uh, I don't. They were actually nice to me while for me, it was the. It wasn't an actual class, but it was a class. The community practicum. So, like having like that independence and freedom to like. It was kind of like, what's the? I don't know the phrase, but it was like, the the final stretch of really putting that project together. And so, and it was more so on my shoulders to that. It, there wasn't any curriculum laid out. I mean, there were some requirements, but you know, like no rigorous requirements saying that this is the way you have to do your final project. And that's what I really. Enjoyed. Um, just off the top of my head, uh, the class with Terry from ProPublica, Pro just because um, it was really Which cool. Class was that? Metrics and outcomes. Yes. It was. Oh. The name is the name is deceiving. 
Um, because, yeah, it was, I think that it gave us, uh, Terry's just an incredible professor, teacher, friend, silly person. Um, so, but I, I mean, I think that like, he was a guy that came in and really was like, let's do this like work together. You're a part of ProPublica. Um, and like vice versa and like let's like dig into this stuff and you really felt like you were like on the journey I um, mean you felt like you, the work you were doing with him was meaningful and uh, and so I, I gained a lot from from that um, and a class to add yeah, well, yeah. what would you add around? I mean, oh add a class oh gosh um, has any I don't think any classes have been added, right since it's not like a whole new class, no. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm making sure yeah. like, that, that nothing new exists. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I had some ideas for like the summer reporting class uh, that would have made it like a little bit more multimedia based. Um, but other than that, I can't really, can't really think of something else. Right? Maybe social media tools part two, like building onto that, yeah. especially as people are starting to get more and more into their communities. Um, that's still a part of like the program where you know if you over the course of the year you have the option of building onto your community. Correct. Yeah, so social media to support too. Um, I think my favorite class was Jeremy Kaplan's class because A, he was an amazing professor. He was a AJ student. part two. Uh, this after Carrie uh, is, uh, I think one of the best professors here at, too. at QB, and probably like in J schools in general. Um, he Absolutely. just like he puts so much work into his classes, and he has refined them to be like he literally the fact that he like schedules things to the minute is something that I find extremely impressive. Uh, but also he is just a great person and I also felt like that class was the most out of my comfort zone from the program because it was not about journalism per se, it was more about the business side and I felt like that was one of the things that opened my eyes the most to something I really was very, very unfamiliar with. Um, so I, that's why I liked that. And the class that I think I would have added that kind of has been but isn't technically uh, mandatory is social video. Um, so I'm actually working with the social video classes on a documentary hate thing, and uh, I just think I, I, when I see them, I'm like, wow, I wish I knew how to do that. Um, yeah, we're thinking about as we move the program to a fall start, um, we're thinking, because we think that too, we just couldn't quite figure out how to like jam it in there, although a lot of you are, are taking it anyway, even though that's extra, you know, work that you have to do, I know. But yeah, I completely agree with that, that one's really important. And, and yeah, Jeremy's class, I mean, we've also talked about how, like ideally in the sequence, that one is better in the middle in some ways, but then Jeremy couldn't teach it, and I was basically like, my students will have Jeremy, and that's just how it is. <laughs> like, I don't care, I don't care if it's not the ideal timing, but like, I want them to have the best of the best, and he like, he is absolutely the best, especially at entrepreneurs. But yeah, that's a great class. And he is also, I mean, an organizer. I saw him right now. Oh, that's right. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, he has a few. He organizes two, and he's an event organizer of a third. Um, a lot of, it's an NYU tech meetup and a journalism meetup. I can't remember the specific names, but I can share them with Carrie tomorrow. Yeah, Charlie. They asked when they've written a feature story and if that's even an important part of their their job. It was important for me when I was in the program um, because it's kind of how I did like my practical project and how I built even stronger relationships with the community. Um, like I shared like a piece like a few days ago and. Then, the people that were featured in the story, they reshared it. Uh, so I, I don't currently do features just because of how the tilt is set up. So we are kind of neutral in the sense of like it's two sides of perspectives kind of colliding into like this debate or a poll, and 
we allow both sides of those communities to you know, vote. And so in the what we call supporting evidence, we present those different perspectives, and that's when we really contextualize those narratives a lot of times. And it also depends on the narrative. So just like just like a news entity, that like there's going to be some quick hits and then like more like longer form stuff. And yeah, I mean, I guess we do do like the weekend features. Like those are what we call medium track stories, where they're like a lot longer and a lot more in depth on a certain subject matter. Um, so yeah, I get to have like a lot of fun with those, but not in a traditional sense where I'm like um, talking to to people like that happens on social after the story is written. So for my current, so my previous job when I was a reporter, I was doing stories every day. Uh, I felt like a lot of what I was doing was churn, um, and it was very frustrating to me. Yeah, just like stuff that The Wire's doing and every other site is doing. So I really liked doing features at my last job because I felt like it gave me a chance to do something more in depth and spend more time on it and put more effort into it and just uh, make it be something that stands out and something I'm proud of and really like add to my portfolio. And then at this job, I've written a couple of times um, about sort of what's been happening with the project. Um, but I'm involved in every single story that gets produced as a part of the project in some way. So I am either helping with uh, sources and research for partner stories um, or involved on several levels for stories we're working on at Republica. So I haven't been doing the writing so much for those. I do writing of sort of smaller pieces that I write about the project, but um, I, I sort of have a hand in a lot of these big stories, and um, I like that. I do miss doing more writing on a regular basis because I feel like it's a a thing where if you get out of, it's like exercise, if you stop doing it, it's really hard to get back into it, like running or something, because um, you're just like, oh, I have to type two sentences in a row. Uh, but um, I, I think it's important because whatever you wind up doing is going to involve writing in some capacity, whether or not that's a, like, a large number of words or little pockets of words. Um, so it's going to be important to be good at writing in whatever it is. Acting words is fun. Um, and just to quickly add on that, just by the nature of the company of Meetup, uh, I, I don't do that type of writing anymore. However, we, um, in all of Meetup's existence, we, they never had a VP of marketing or branding, and that has, uh, we recently hired that person. And so our marketing team uh, and branding team is expanding, which means like people running social media, people telling stories um, about organizers and members. And that's kind of like the path that I see myself moving into at Meetup. Um, and so I think that that kind of lends itself because I have a background in social journalism and writing, I think that um, you can kind of see how like that type of writing could then lend itself nicely to, in my case, like moving into that type of um, position. I'm just curious real quick, how, have you seen like, I mean sort of post-2016, is there any difference in the amount of people participating in meetups and things? I mean, is it pretty similar? Is there any like differences and, I don't know, anything like that? Yeah. Are there so, types of them that are coming up? Or? Yeah. Um, when I actually, I started February of 2017 at Meetup. Um, and I think the week after, or the week before I started, our company actually shut down for a few days. And we they coded um, and launched this thing called Resist. And so basically, they, we launched all of these meetups um, where we allowed people within their local communities to form together, um, to talk through policy, to talk through different ways to advocate for whether it's running for local government or anything like that. Um, and so that obviously generated a huge spike kind of in participation in RSVPs um, and that sort of thing. But I think that, uh, that in terms of like people showing up and being in real life, I think that we're seeing a gradual increase. And I think just generally in our nation right now, we're seeing a lot of people kind of rise up and, and show up to places. And I think that um, Meetup is certainly recognizing that. And, and that's a huge part of like what we're focusing on in the future. 
for sure.